Motoring 2013 is brought to you in part by Shell V-Power Premium Gasoline. This is Jose Munoz, and this is a man who is obsessed. He is head of marketing and sales for Nissan in the Americas, and he says he goes to bed and he wakes up in the morning with one thought, how to achieve for Nissan a 10% market share in the United States. Right now it stands at 7.9. In Canada, it's just over five. Well, it's all about product, and this week we're in beautiful Southern California to check out a new Nissan vehicle they will hope will up those market share numbers. In Canada, it's always has been known as the Versa, but this car has got kind of a global buzz to it now, so it's now known as the 2014 Nissan Note. The Versa hatchback has been a really successful uh, product for us in Canada. As it's aged, we've fallen off a little bit last year, but uh, we expect to rebound dramatically this year with the new 2014 Versa Note. In Canada, the Nissan's got about 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 market share when you include Infiniti. And the global plan calls for Nissan to have 8% market share in all the markets in which it competes. So obviously, Canada's underperforming. And Nissan Note is late to the game in the sense that uh, the competition has had uh, I would argue over the last five years, far more competitive products. Nissan uh, finally has a hatchback in this segment, priced just around $13,000 to start, which means it will be competitive in the marketplace. I think it looks terrific. Versus of the past have look like ugly sausages to me, and th this has some shapes and curves to it, low overhangs, um, there's nice little design features around the tail lights, uh, so I think a design, it's really great. When you've got a car with about 110 horsepower, you're not usually talking about aerodynamics, but however, in this new Versa Note, they have tried with the styling. In fact, they're calling the roof a squash line, it's supposed to represent a squash ball coming off a wall. I know, designers. Even the taillights have little vents to disperse the air and once again, hopefully help this car get what Nissan claims is a 17% increase in fuel economy. But the real brilliance of this vehicle is the back doors. These open at 90 degrees, easy to get in and out, and the best is yet to come. You know that seat belt that always gets in the way when you're folding the seats up and down? Not with the note. There's a little spot, slips right in, Bob's your uncle. Small car with some big ideas. I think they're hitting a high note with this car. I found it a pleasure to drive. We're here in Southern California. It was on concrete highways. The suspension was great. It took a few corners, a little bit higher than the posted speed limit. It reacted well. I can't find any real faults with the car. I mean, you can even get the top line one with heated seats, you know? What's not to like? It's a 1.6 four cylinder with a CVT transmission, a continuously variable transmission. 109 horsepower is the rated horsepower, but combined with the CVT, we're really able to extract that horsepower and make the most of it in terms of performance, but also fuel economy. Again, delivering you know, 4.8 highway is just amazing fuel economy performance. I'm not a big fan of backup cameras, probably because I grew up using my mirrors and I just feel more comfortable doing it that way. However, this new Versa Note comes with something called a round view monitor. There's four cameras in the car. They call this a first in this segment. Well, what they did was they set up a little demo for us. They blacked out the windows and we could only back up using the monitor. Well, I seem to do okay although there were no other cars around. However, as you can see, I am concentrating solely on that monitor. And you know, in real life, parking lots are very dangerous places and all sorts of things can be happening outside the camera's view. So a word of caution, use the backup camera, but be very, very careful. And speaking of that monitor, it's my pet peeve. At 4.3 inches, it's way too small, it's distracting. It should be a minimum of seven inches. The interior is nice and big, and that's really important uh, uh, because the buyers who buy this car are the toughest buyers of all. When you're spending thirteen to $18,000 on a car, it means that's all the money you have for a car, and you need to get it right, and it needs to be extremely versatile. I mean, look at the customer needs and desires for the compact entry segment. It clearly values at the top of the list, right? You're looking for space efficiency, fuel efficiency, and certainly cost of ownership via purchase price and operating cost. And with the Versa Note, we believe we've nailed all those elements. So we're, we're excited to see what we can do with it, but clearly the, the segment is, is geared towards value. So you've met the entry-level Note. Now meet the entry-level commercial van that's small, cute, and carries all your junk. Street cars. 
Maybe we should take that more literally. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Do you hear that? Now that's a sound that hasn't been heard under the hood of a GM car in North America for longer than motoring's been on the air, and that's 25 years. On this edition of Test Drive, we take a look at the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Now this one, it's the much-anticipated diesel. The newest Chevrolet Cruze is powered by a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder clean diesel. It is typical of the units from Europe in that it displaces a modest two liters, but thanks to the variable vane turbocharger, it produces better power than either of the Cruze's two gasoline-powered alternatives, and it does so without the anticipated low-end turbo lag. In this case, the diesel develops 151 horsepower and 264 pound-feet of torque at a low 2,000 RPM. Now that's 13 horsepower and 116 pound-feet of torque more than the 1.4 litre turbocharged gas engine. In other words, stout numbers for a compact sedan. This engine has a really neat feature. For a period of 10 seconds, it goes into an overboost mode, which bumps the peak torque from 264 to 280 pound-feet. Now you're saying, 10 seconds, not long enough. Well, in the real world, it's there whenever the driver wants it. For instance, it takes less than nine seconds to get from rest to 100 kilometers an hour. You nail the gas and that overboost mode is always there. The power is relayed to the front wheels through a six-speed manumatic that for once has a real manual mode. While the torque is such that this feature will see little if any use, it does not detract from the fact that it works properly, unlike every other GM manumatic. It also has a range of ratios that maximizes the diesel engine's sweetness. It can even spin the wheels during an enthusiastic takeoff. So why all the hoopla about a diesel engine? Quite simply, aside from the outstanding torque advantage this car enjoys over its gasoline-powered siblings, it all boils down to fuel economy. On the highway, this thing sips. 4.2 litres per 100 kilometres of diesel. Now that is very good in its own right, but what really impressed me is the fact that this car is one of the very, very few ever to match its official average fuel economy number. Now this thing is actually rated at six litres per 100 kilometres. We've been averaging 5.9, and if you look at the trip computer, that's based over a distance of 750 kilometres. When it comes to ride and handling, the diesel does not feel any different from the regular model. Part of it boils down to the fact that the engine is light, at least for a diesel. As it weighs just 185 kilograms, it does not introduce any additional understeer when the cruise is pushed towards its traction limit. The cabin of this cruise diesel is very nicely laid out. Comfortable heated leather seats and a very logical layout. The one thing I did like was the Chevrolet MyLink. Now this thing is very easy to use thanks to the touch screen and the way the controls are all laid out. You know, Best and GM don't very often go in the same sentence. Credit where credit's due, they do when it comes to MyLink. Likewise, the diesel suspension has been tuned to deliver a comfortable ride even as it limits body roll when attacking the pylon test. Factor in the 215-55R17 tires and a steering setup that's commendably poised and polished to the feel, and the diesel is actually fun to drive. One tends not to think of a diesel-powered ride as being remotely sporty. The cruise more than qualifies. Even the brake pedal has a crisp feel. How times are changing. I would have bet that you would never ever have seen another diesel engine under the hood of a GM passenger car for as long as I was around. Well, you know what? Thank goodness I was wrong. The diesel in this cruise is one sweet engine, quiet, refined, and a very willing workhorse. And you know, how can you better that? Torque, horsepower, and fuel economy, and it's better than the gasoline engines. Wonderful.
Did you know? Brought to you by the all-new Kia Sportage. Kia, the power to surprise. It's very seldom that car companies allow media with cameras rolling to have access to their manufacturing plant, unless that company is Kia. Kia Canada invited Motoring to check out its world-class $1.2 billion European production plant in Zelina, Slovakia. The plant began production in 2006 and produces more than 300,000 new vehicles annually. Currently, we produce three different models, Kia Seed, Kia Sportage and Kia Venga. Kia Seed is produced in three different body versions, five-door hatchback, then a sporty wagon, and Pro Seed. It's a sporty version of uh, Kia Seed. All these cars are produced for European market. Kia Seed is exported only in Europe. Also the name of Seed means community of Europe or European design. So the vehicle is produced and built only for Europe. The facility utilizes a large number of state-of-the-art manufacturing technologies, including more than 400 robots. Kia is the only car manufacturer in the region that produces engines in-house, with two plants at the facility rather than importing them from other locations. From my experience, before 2004, Kia was not well known here in the region. In 2004, where the headquarters, Kia Motors Corporation, decided to build a plant, so the Kia brand started to build its name. Right now, we are one of the biggest employers in the north of Zelina. We employ almost 4,000 employees, but all together with our suppliers here in the region, we have additional 10,000 employees with the suppliers. So Kia name, Kia brand is very popular in Slovakia within the last seven years. having so much fun. We're learning all kinds of amazing driving skills as well as so much about the Cadillac ATS vehicles, some defensive driving, some dangerous driving that I wouldn't necessarily do on the road, as well as some things I'll learn that I can use in my day-to-day -day driving life. So it's been fantastic so far. The Motoring Tip of the Week is brought to you by Walmart. For everyday low prices on Pennzoil, conventional and synthetic oils. Our Motoring Tip of the Week, well this week I'm gonna call it playing by the rules. Now we often get emails from viewers who are asking specific questions about either break-in procedure or service interval for their particular make and model of vehicle. Basically, when I say playing by the rules, what I'm referring to is making sure that you're playing by the rules of your car manufacturer in terms of break-in and service intervals so that you keep your warranty in effect. You don't want to do anything that would break or contravene the warranty requirements of that new vehicle. That's part of what you've paid for buying that nice new vehicle is that warranty coverage. Could be 80, 100,000 K or more. So you want to play by those rules. Where are the rules? Well, they're certainly found in the vehicle owner's manual. And that can, those requirements can vary between one make and model of vehicle and one manufacturer and another. Uh, for example, this GM light truck, because it could possibly be used for towing uh, large trailers, GM says that during the break-in period, not to tow a trailer. Most of the requirements of breaking in a new engine are not all that elaborate on, on modern vehicles. It's basically just, you know, don't speed, don't, don't do any, you know, full throttle starts, don't use the brakes aggressively hard if you can avoid it. Basically, just take it easy for the first 800 to 1,000 K, and that's what most break-in procedures ask for. But here again, if your vehicle manufacturer calls for something specific and outside of those parameters, that's what you have to follow. Now in terms of changing your motor oil and servicing your vehicle, you could have different grades of motor oil, you could have a full synthetic motor oil that your manufacturer specifies for your vehicle, and it doesn't have to be a high-end vehicle if it's fairly new, it could be a pretty basic vehicle and still have full synthetic 0W20 motor oil. That, of course, is the oil you want to use right across the board every time you top up, every time you change, in order to, quote, play by the rules and keep that warranty in effect. So you want to make sure you're changing the oil at the right intervals, the filters, getting it serviced, and breaking it in properly. Check your owner's manual for those specific guidelines. That's your motoring tip of the week. Three years ago, Nissan jumped into the commercial van market with the full-size NV. 
now follows the smaller NV200. Certainly part of Nissan's NV200 marketing plan is to show off its ability to customize itself to unique businesses, like this California-flavored custom surfboard shop van. Nissan uses a two-liter four-cylinder gas engine to drive the 200's automatic CVT transmission. This combination offers just enough power, but more importantly, very decent fuel economy. On the road, the van is quick, nimble, with a tight turning radius, easy steering, and good tracking. The instruments are simple, well laid out, and the gear selector is placed nice and high in the center stack, all the better to blind shift with. In fact, the only drawback I found all day was with the windowless body, which makes backing out of driveways tough. Really big blind spot. So what's important in a commercial delivery van? Well, for starters, a large door, easy in and out. Guy's gonna do this a couple of hundred times a day. Sliding doors, one-hander, easy in and out. Move around to the back of the van where the real business takes place and notice that the doors are 70-30 split. Why? Because frankly, you can work out of one door pretty much all day long. You don't want to be opening two doors all day long. Opens to 90 degrees, but it also opens to 180 degrees. You can get a pallet in there. What else? Low floor, very low floor, below my knee. This is easy to get things in and out of. Keep coming, and we go to the other side, and what do we got? Another sliding door. Why? Because frankly, in some alleyways, you never know whether you can only access the left or the right. And finally, back to the front, and you'll notice a flat workspace. This seat folds down. You can take somebody with you, but most of the time, it's just a work area. And finally, up at the front, small engine, small bills. This is an entry-level, small, commercial van, and Nissan's probably gonna do very well with it. The front-wheel drive design of the NV200 creates that low load floor, another advantage of which is a low roof, a must for getting into urban underground garages. The NV200's design emphasis on access has its sales off to a running start by winning the distinction of the new official taxi of New York City. These people movers start rolling in the Big Apple this coming fall. So, will it work? Well, they're getting into a market at the right time with a small, practical vehicle that's highly customizable for small, unique businesses. But they wouldn't mind a few fleet customers either. Are you listening, FedEx? This small box may yet turn out to be big money. Closed captioning for Motoring 2013 is brought to you by Greener, Fuel Efficient, Global. This is Chevrolet Now, driving our world forward. We're fortunate in this great country of ours to drive in all of our fine cities. In Montreal, it seems they're really good at starting construction projects, not so good at finishing them. In Ottawa, apparently you have to be born there to know the names of the streets because they're not telling anybody else. In Toronto, our home city, the big deal seems to always be about mass transit. How do we get people from one place to another? Right now, an issue is going on. Somebody's proposing that we close a couple of major arterial roads during rush hour to passenger cars and only allow streetcars. Well, streetcars are really cool if you live at one end of the streetcar line and work at the other, but if you want to pick up the kids at school on the way home from work or maybe grab your dry cleaning or get some KFC for dinner, the guy's not jumping off the tracks for you. The biggest supporter of mass transit in this country well, he's probably the guy behind you on the freeway who wishes you were in mass transit so he could have the car to himself. I could actually get behind that. Now, the politicians at the federal, provincial, and municipal level, they can't agree 
that the sun rises in the east. They always want to just blame the car for their own incompetence because they can't figure out how to make mass transit work in this country. The fact is, as I've said before, we have a mass transit system in this country. It's called the passenger car. Now, opponents of the car point to places like New York and Paris with their concentrated populations downtown. Their population density is decreasing. People don't want to live in a little rabbit warren with a window box. They want to live in a house with a lawn and maybe a pool. That's where the, the action is. That's only enabled by the passenger car. So we've got to find ways not to stop cars, but to make it more efficient to use your car. Your car is, cleans up the pollution. The exhaust coming out your tailpipe is cleaner than the air going in. So these streetcars, what they're doing is they're blocking passenger cars. You get ahead of a streetcar, you got a five minute shot downtown. You get behind a streetcar, you might as well pack a lunch. Which reminds me, maybe we should take the streetcars off the streets and put them, well oh, geez, maybe you can put them underground and call them subways. It's just a thought. I'm Jim Kenzie. So the new Versa Note is heading to a showroom near you. What do I think of it? Well, to be honest, I never liked the old Versa. Maybe I just couldn't get by that CVT transmission, but I also found the styling kind of dated. Well, that has changed. As we said earlier, I love the styling of the new vehicle, and the second generation CVT is definitely an improvement over the last. But what impressed me most about this new car is that we drove over a lot of rough and concrete roads down here in California, and this car was extremely quiet. And that is saying something for this segment. Will it do well enough in the showroom to help the Nissan marketing people get a good night's sleep? Well, time will tell. Before we go, make sure you check us out at MotoringTV.com and also join us on Facebook. We want you to get in on the conversation for the total motoring experience. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. We've been a really good conquesting brand, uh, and that's been part of our sales success, if you will. And hopefully we'll be able to get some new customers from some of the other brands to consider the cadenza and move into our product lineup. Motoring 2013 has been brought to you in part by Shell V-Power, premium gasoline.